In the ICP ecosystem, we're seeing a lot of developers from big tech companies like Google, Uber, Stripe, et cetera, working nights and weekends prototyping Web3 concepts on the internet computer. So eventually, like many founders building on the IC, they'll need to make that pivot from Web2 to Web3. So we're going to hear from Tom Saris and Maria Shen, two early investors who have made that pivot and are now making big bets on Web3. So Tom Saris is an experienced tech entrepreneur who raised the first ever Internet Series A. He is a crowdfunding pioneer, early crypto investor dating back to 2014, and now for the first time, a fund manager via Warburg Saris. He is solely focused on supporting other founders with more than 60 projects funded to date. Maria Shen is a partner at Electric Capital, which is an early stage venture firm focused on cryptocurrencies, blockchain, fintech, and marketplaces. Prior to Electric Capital, Maria was the CTO and co-founder of a startup that helped SMBs create their supply chains with manufacturers around the world. Prior to that, Maria was working on search technology at Microsoft. Welcome, Tom and Maria. So Maria, Electric Capital just announced a $1 billion fund that's fully dedicated to Web3. Tell us more about the investment philosophy behind this fund and what you're looking to invest in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we actually also talk a lot about the, uh, the ideas that we want to fund in our announcement post. So for anyone who wants to take a look at that, um, it's on our website as well. But you know, just taking a step back, I think the way we thought about it um, when this when Electric first got started in 2018 is is still how we think about it today, which is that all of a sudden, um, you know, there there are all different types of opportunities in crypto and things that you can build, and uh, especially back in 2018, I think people were saying things like blockchain, not crypto, or like you know maybe this is. Uh, 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 you know, this this could be like a great enterprise use case. Um, the the kind of market and and the use case we latched onto was um, was actually that crypto was programmable money, and that it was fundamentally going to build a new set of finance rails. Um, and our investments have really focused on that. Um, you know, in layer ones, which we see as uh, the settlement layer. Um, in DeFi, obviously, once that started taking off, um, in NFTs, which we see as assets, um, internet native assets, and um, with assets, all sorts of financial products can be built on top. If you think about, uh, you know, the housing market today, we have houses as assets and then the housing market on top. And so similarly, that's how we look at NFTs. Um, and then, of course, now the DAO space as well is uh, extremely interesting um, it's effectively allowing any group of people anywhere in the world of any size from a group of three to, you know, 300,000 can all of a sudden pool capital extremely quickly and then be able to allocate and also govern that capital um, all online, which we think is a huge unlock. Um, and, so, uh, and so, you know, we invest across all of these different verticals um, and of course, we also invest in decentralized infrastructure the way we see it as that um, as developers are building these applications, they will need uh, they will need better tooling. And so that's something that we look at as well. Awesome. Amazing. So same type of question posed to Tom. So Tom, similar to Electric Capital, Warburg Sarah's was an early investor in Definity and continues to be an active investor in Web3, especially you know, ICP-based projects. So you are this veteran company builder and you've already had this big investing career before Web3 really became the space to invest in. So what prompted this pivot into Web3 for you? Yeah, I mean, so I got involved pretty early in the crypto space. Um, and, you know, I, you know, in my first company, I was pretty active in uh, a lot of the early crowdfunding, uh, which I thought was a very, um, you know, uh, democratized way of raising capital, right? We initially went after the political sphere through our company. Um, and focused on the democratization of political giving 
to essentially layer the level of the playing field uh, for anybody that wanted to run for public office, political entrepreneurs, if you will. And um, so I've always been kind of interested in that concept more broadly. And then I had a really cool opportunity in 2012 to partner with Naval, who at the time was uh, building Angel List, which I thought was one of the coolest projects um, out there, certainly at the time. Um, and uh, he and I basically collaborated to try and raise the first ever internet-based Series A, <clears throat> which had never been actually done before at the time. Um, and I remember you know, working on that with him and I literally went to go get a haircut and uh, while I'm sitting there getting a haircut, my phone's blowing up with messages, text messages, emails, you name it. And um, I'm like, man, what is going on? This is super crazy. Um, and I, I get out of my haircut, I look at my phone, it's like all of these investors from like all over the world that are emailing me and pinging me and messaging me about investing in my company. And I was like, holy shit, this is crazy. And so I ran as fast as I could back to my office and um, ended up raising $8 million in 10 days entirely over the internet. And from that moment on, I was a pretty huge believer uh, and, the, and, and the value of crowdfunding more broadly. And so I think crypto was really just sort of a natural segue, except now you can raise like $200 million in eight nanoseconds. So it's a little bit different. <laughs> um, <laughs> equally as big of ideas, right? Um, <clears throat> but, you know, so 2013, 2014 kind of rolled around and, you know, yeah, there were, I was in San Francisco and my partner, Bettina, was pretty active in the crypto community then and uh, got to spend a lot of time with a lot of these early crypto anarchists. Um, and, you know, when they started talking about decentralized autonomous companies and decentralized autonomous organizations, I was like, wow, that's really cool. Imagine if I could automate my board, right? That's basically what I could do. I was like, that's a really big idea. That's a big dream. And I started meeting people in crypto. I had an opportunity to meet Dominic, uh, who at the time was pretty active in Bitcoin and doing a lot of work in the Ethereum community. Uh, I got to spend a lot of time with a good friend, uh, Fabian Vogelsteller, who invented ERC-20. Um, that was kind of his main thing. That's a Miss browser and um, you know the first implementation of the Ethereum wallet. Um, all the different ideas that were coming out of him and. Gavin Wood and Yutta Steiner, who were, you know, in the process of building F-Core, Parity, and then ultimately Polkadot. Um, some of the early, you know, uh, Ethereum core devs, you know, the guys over at Near, Ilya and Sasha, who were doing a lot of middleware development for uh, Ethereum. And I just remember thinking to myself, these are the smartest human beings on planet Earth. They're computer scientists, they're financial wizards, right? They're economists, they're distributed systems architects. I was like, man, if all of these guys are coming to this one location, <laughs> location, right, to, to, to build uh, Web3, to create this like highly composable uh, internet world, um, just based on my own experiences with Web2 um, and some of the composability issues that we had with permissioned APIs and you know, platform risk and stuff like that, that was becoming more and more prevalent every day. Um, I said, well, I better stop everything I'm doing and dedicate essentially all of my time to this. Um, and so that was really the decision. You know, it kind of goes back to the question you were asking earlier, like how do you choose founders? Um, you know, Reed Hoffman was uh, one of my first investors in my company and invited me to his office once. And uh, he told me this story about how somebody called him and said, oh, I say, I saw you invested in Rally. I, you know, you might be interested in our company too, because it's very similar. And he said, he's, he said, you know what I told him? I said, what'd you tell him? He said, I don't invest in companies, I invest in people. And I feel like that was something that really stuck with me. I was like, this guy isn't making a bet on Rally or the tech. Uh, or the things that I'm building. He's basically making a bet on me as an entrepreneur, a person who will do whatever it takes to build whatever it is that I'm building, you know, uh, chase big ideas, 
seek alpha all the time and fundamentally, you know, try to build the Sears tower of my own generation. Um, and so that with that sort of philosophy, you know, as a founder, as well as now, a, a, as an, as an investor, um, it's one of the, it's the primary metric that I look at, uh, when I'm investing in a new project. And that is, you know, are you that kind of person? I'm not investing necessarily in the project that they're doing. I'm investing in them, the person and their ability to pull it off. And so we were, you know, just like, you know, whether it's Definity or, you know, um, you know, some of these other projects, you know, we were investing in those founders, those people, whether it was time and elbow grease and money from time to time, that, that was really the primary metric that we focused on. Amazing. Yeah. So it's like every smart person and every yeah. smart venture capitalist is pivoting into Web3 if they haven't already. So yeah. in the next thing I'm wondering too is, you know, why the ICP ecosystem and the internet computer? You know, we heard Olaf from Polychain talk about how the internet computer is, you know, a fundamentally more advanced blockchain than Ethereum or other EVM based chains. And so how does, you know, the internet computer and the ICP ecosystem potentially fit into your investment philosophy? Yeah, I mean, I think that's basically where we're going. We're building these large scale internet based deterministic state machines. Right. That's what these things are. They're all internet computers, right? When you read and you learn about Ethereum in the early days and this idea, I'm going to build a world computer. I'm like, holy fuck, that's a massive idea. I really want to be involved with that. And I think, you know, um, when we sort of sat back and we look at all the different opportunities, because there's definitely a lot of different opportunities uh, from a layer one perspective. Um, what we really liked about Definity uh, was that they really took that idea much more seriously than I think the early implementation of Ethereum, which was really based, mostly based on uh, standards. So ERC-20 being a nine function standard on how we create a token, send a token, check balances, whatever, right? The community agreed, these are the functions we're gonna basically use to call into other applications to do these things. Um, I, you know, Definity said, no, 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 we're going to actually create an entire canister concept where the canister itself, which is open source code, um, is the fundamental standard. And so um, it creates something that is ultimately infinitely more scalable in a lot of ways. Um, and, they, and they basically built the IC with this concept of, of, of a computer in mind from the ground up, right? Um, and, you know, some of those things, like, for example, being able to host the entire application on the IC, right? You see a lot of these man in the middle attacks that are going after the client interface, right? Happens every day. Um, hundreds of millions of crypto being lost, right? You can now secure the entire application, right, on, on the IC. And that's a really powerful idea, especially when you start scaling DeFi, into hundreds of billions in value, right? You're gonna need to find ways to secure that client interface as well as you've secured effectively the back end of, of that application itself. Um, and then they can do it because of the way they've constructed their network, right? Um, has essentially allowed them to host those applications at a much lower cost than per se, um, you know, any of the other um, you know, networks out there where, you know, to, the cost of hosting the whole application is just prohibitive, right? And so you have to use other kinds of tooling like IPFS or whatever to host different elements of these different things. Um, or as the IC, it's, it really kind of like does the entire application. So they've implemented a slightly different version, right, of these kind of computers. I, I, I like the way that they've implemented. They've come up with a lot of really novel cryptography like chain key where you can call state and another application sitting on another network, which is really a fundamental innovation, right? I mean, it's truly innovative. Um, and I think that's one of the things that we always really liked about, you know, Definity is that, you know, they really took R&D very seriously as a part of building essentially the next version of the internet, right? Where, you know, you have these kind of fully decentralized internet computers um, that you can run autonomous software applications on top of. Um, and, you know, the way they went about it is just so powerful 
um, it very easily sits into our investment thesis for sure. Awesome. Yeah, it truly is unique, you know, having everything run 100% on chain. Um, yeah. That's that's a great And you're going to have to eventually. Yeah, yeah. Um, so next, I want to talk about some of the category focuses for Supernova. So one of the most relevant use cases for blockchain technology right now is DeFi. You know, DeFi went from the ICO days to what was being called the <clears throat> DeFi summer. Um, to DeFi 2.0. And now developers are leveraging the internet computer to create gasless and bridgeless DeFi. So I want to position this next question to Maria. So, you know, Maria, you had said that DeFi is kind of baked into this thesis for electric capital and for this billion dollar fund. So what are you seeing, Maria, in this arc of DeFi and what learnings can help founders here? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, first of all, I, I do think crypto has this really amazing um, ability to democratize finance and people talk a lot about it. And I don't, I don't think we've actually kind of fulfilled that dream yet. Um, and I, but I, but I do think the, the capability is there. All of a sudden you have value that's borderless um, and near instantaneous to transfer. Um, and the, you know, the kind of the amazing thing with programmable money, which is different from just regular money is you can write rules on top of it. Um, just simple if this, then that types of rules are what makes DeFi remarkable um, in that, uh, you know, it, all of a sudden, anyone in the world can create a market um, just by writing very simple sets of rules. Um, so I think, you know, the, the trend, the, the question in, in DeFi, um, or at least one question I've always had is around, uh, you know, defensibility, what makes something defensible? Um, if everything is is out in the open, um, which is which is great because I think it also there's a lot of uh, there's so many kind of even security benefits to open source software. But if everything is out in the open, um, you know, doesn't that make everything uh, extremely forkable? Um, and that's been a question that I think a lot of people have had since DeFi's beginnings, and it's been interesting seeing kind of the how the space has has answered that question. Um, early DeFi, I think a lot of, uh, you know, a, a lot of emphasis was on the community itself or the ability for um, the founding team to build features faster than competitors can, can fork. Um, and I think now we're seeing um, this focus on protocol controlled value where all of a sudden it's not, you know, you can fork a protocol, but you can't fork that protocol's treasury. Um, and that's been, you know, I, I think that's been a really interesting new development in, in, in how in defensibility for these DeFi protocols where you see all of a sudden these structural reasons um, that these protocols are, you know, that these protocols are going to be enduring and, and will be around for a long time is the network effects around building a large treasury and being able to utilize that. For sure. Yeah, there's so much opportunity there. And it seems like one of the hottest spaces in you know, blockchain right now. So really excited to see you know, the news from your fund about what's coming and you know, what kinds of companies and projects that you're going to invest in. Um, so I want to talk about some trends in Metaverse and GameFi. These are two other tracks of the hackathon. Um, this is a new hot space with a big emphasis on new. Um, so Tom, how should founders position a Metaverse or a gaming startup when they come to pitch you? Like what would make you say, yes, I'm going to write a check for this company? Yeah, sure. I, that's a good question. So I think first I should probably... Uh, point out to uh, you know the obvious to everyone. And in, in my opinion, it's not a metaverse unless it's built on a Web three stack, right? So if you look at you know even some of the things that are going on in Web two, whether it's Facebook or whatever, launching Meta and so on, it's like they're they're trying to build you know a metaverse that's centrally controlled, which is 
in my opinion, the exact opposite of a true metaverse, right? And so I think these metaverse environments are, you know, uh, decentralized from a control perspective and so on. But when we invest, you know, we invest, uh, you know, up the sort of technology stacks of these different ecosystems. So we invest into the middleware layer and we invest into the application layer. An application layer uh, really is the demand side uh, of the equation for this kind of finite supply of compute, right? So the computability of the network itself, that should be hopefully growing more and more and more over time as more nodes are added to the network, right? Um, so when you have these different kinds of applications, whether it's their financial applications or gaming applications, right? Really, you know, when we look at, you know, the verticals that we invest in, on the application layer, we sort of look at the verticals and say, okay, where are we going to get the greatest amount of adoption of Web3, right? Gaming is a great category. Uh, finance is a great category. You know, uh, social, probably pretty soon. Uh, real assets, I think, is going to be a big one uh, as well, too, uh, in terms of creating demand side. Uh, opportunities around, you know, any of any of these kind of like uh, machines. Um, and so when we look at gaming, we kind of look at the, you know, the game stack itself. Like if you're going to go build a game, there's a lot of stuff you need, right? Uh, you need the, you need all sorts of different kinds of component architecture, right? You can look at say companies like Unity, right? Where they provide essentially a tool set for game developers to build games. Uh, and that every single one of those things is going to have to exist on Web3, right? Except that instead of being controlled by Unity, it'll be decentralized in terms of um, ownership and governance around the actual components that sit within the Unity environment, right? Um, and so we're looking at projects that are building middleware solutions that enable game development because we want to see a proliferation of gaming applications built on top of them on top of a given ecosystem, right? So the mo more middleware exists, right? Middleware is essentially dev tech and tools that make application development faster, cheaper, and easier, right? That's the whole point. And so when we sit back, we say, okay, what if we want millions and billions of gaming apps to exist? What do we need to invest in? Because that's how we think. Let's invest in, you know, DevOps game live ops solutions for, you know, on-chain game mechanics and on-chain game metrics, right? Because being able to have things like, um, you know, persistent and stateful, you know, representation of gaming data for, say, a simple leaderboard concept inside of a game to rank players. Who are battling it out in some kind of metaverse or virtual environment is going to be fundamentally important in order to have valid data for reporting who a winner is of a given tournament or something like that, right? Uh, or in marketplaces for you know trading NFTs related to game development or being able to port one game asset from another from one game to another game to another game or Compugacha tactics to do combinatorial effects to create entirely new rare assets that are minted based on some kind of, you know, game mechanics. So we think about a lot of that stuff when we're investing in gaming and how can we create or invest in things that will enable, uh, you know, your average developer or designer uh, to very quickly and easily build a new game itself. So, and in addition to the game, right? Uh, investing in those as well too. Yeah, totally. Gaming is this sector that it's like the more you think about it, the more complex it becomes. Like, you know, there's so many aspects of this industry. It's like there's graphic design, there's storytelling, there's music, there's the middleware that you're talking about. There's these virtual exactly. environments, there's software, there's hardware. Like it just keeps getting more and more complex. And so, you know, game, GameFi and Metaverse is just another, you know, evolution of this. And it's so fascinating to yeah. hear and take. And, you know, I love what you said about it's not a Metaverse unless it's built fully on Web3. And, 
you know, speaking of that social perspective too, you know, I want to be as far away from Zuckerberg's metaverse as I possibly can. You will not sure. catch me there. And, you know, I think this, this brings me to this um, other topic of decentralized social too, which is something mm. I'm really fascinated by. Yeah. So, I mean, with Elon buying Twitter and, you know, what awesome. I'm sensing is just like this huge cultural fatigue of Web2 social um, being owned by big tech and, you know, rich billionaires just coming in and be, being able to buy an entire social channel. Um, you know, I think mm -hmm. entrepreneurs are really going to start flooding into Web3. Um, so I want to point this question to Maria first, and Tom, if you have you know insights on this, feel free to mm -hmm. jump in. But um, I want to hear about kind of your perspective on the opportunity around decentralized social. This is another category in the hackathon. Yeah, I think um, whenever it, social relies entirely on social graphs, and whenever there's a new social graph being drawn, there's the opportunity for a huge platform to emerge. Um, you saw this with uh, Facebook, right? Has a different social graph than perhaps LinkedIn, um, which has a different social graph from TikTok. And so whenever a new platform has been able to draw a new graph, um, it, it, you know, it, it can expand extremely rapidly. Um, and so similarly, I think there's a social graph now being drawn in crypto that no one is capturing. Um, perhaps Twitter is capturing it the best, but it's still... Um, uh, it's still actually just a kind of web two approach to, to what it can actually look like. But this, this new social graph that's being drawn is based on ownership. What NFTs do you own? What tokens do you own? Um, and then what have you done with that ownership? Have you used your tokens to um, provide liquidity in DeFi protocols? If so, how much liquidity? Um, and also what types of protocols? How early were you? Um, and you know, if you hold NFTs, then uh, did you did you mint the original CryptoPunk or did you buy it later on? Um, or if you have a uh, if you are a participant in a DAO, um, are you a regular voter or are you uh, absent most of the time? Um, and you know, how active are you in governance and how have you voted? I think all of these signals are effectively being pushed live to uh, to the blockchain. And so the blockchain is actually like an auto updating social media feed that no one has been able to capture yet. Um, and I think the, the promise there is huge. And so you see early examples like that, um, of that where uh, Context app as an example, which is an uh, application on Ethereum is effectively a social feed of what new asset has entered someone's wallet. Um, and that's a social feed that, you know, like, can you imagine like that being the news feed for Facebook or for Instagram? Like it's actually, it's, it's ludicrous um, to even think about. And, and I think that's, that's where the opportunity is, is something so fundamentally new and Web3 native um, and really breaks from the mold of how we've been thinking about social up until now. I'm skeptical of approaches to social that just takes what we know and you know, adds like sprinkles in decentralization or sprinkles in tokens, I tend to think that that's not going to work. You know, it's interesting. I, I got to be in Silicon Valley from 26, 2006 to 20, roughly 2016, you know, uh, window, which was when basically every social network was born, built and, and grown, right? Facebook launched in 2006, right? And a whole Twitter launched, I don't know, maybe a year or two later, and so being there in the early days and watching these networks grow and, and being totally, you know, fascinated with how the power of network effect, right? These guys were able to build networks that were so insanely powerful through, you know, uh, uh, you know, viral coefficients of growth where one user begets one or more new users, right? If one user gets one new user, you have infinite linear growth. If you have one user that gets slightly more than one new user, you have hyper growth, right? And a lot of these social networks were basically spamming the shit out of the world with like buttons and all sorts of stuff to drive viral growth of their platform. 
and then retention of users through other types of features like you were tagged in a photo or whatever that kept them you know, on a daily active user kind of path. Um, and as a result, you know, the ones who ended up winning were able to build such ridiculously powerful moats around their company that they were able to engage in bad behavior, right? And that bad behavior we now know as platform risk, where you build something on top of one of these companies, they like what you're doing, and so they can turn around, cut off your access, turn off your endpoints, and then ultimately basically relaunch that new feed, that new, that your company as a feature, right? To billions of users, to drive retention and growth, right? To, to maintain their moat. Um, and, you know, that kind of worked for a while. And I think, you know, one of the things that I saw about Web3 that was really, you know, pretty amazing was, you know, the idea of, you know, persistent API, the equivalent of a persistent API, right? You can't turn off the access to these things. Uh, I can build on top of something else and not worry that, that it's ultimately going to get turned off. Um, so you actually dramatically reduce platform risk uh, as a result uh, of doing something like that. The other thing is, is the future social networks built on top of a Web3 stack are going to be even more powerful from a network effect perspective, right? And I'll give you an example. Like the second, like, yeah, I can go on Facebook and I'm connected to all my friends and it's really my friends that effectively keep me connected to Facebook, right? That, that's the sort of uh, viral effect or network effect principle. But the second you start connecting your assets to these things, the network effect becomes insanely more powerful right? Like the average person changes their bank account, like maybe every 20 years, right? But they change their credit cards all the freaking time because they can port their debt over to another company and pay a lower interest rate. And so you get a lot more competitive, you know, offerings at the credit card layer, as opposed to say banks, which basically haven't innovated in a hundred years. And so when you start thinking about, you know, the future social networking you know, applications in the future, they're going to be even more powerful than they are today in terms of network effect principles. Um, and what you get with Web3 is instead of having, you know, a board of directors and a CEO and, you know, this kind of bureaucratic governance layer that sits over and controls everything that happens in these networks, like we've seen in the, in, and certainly are still experiencing today some of that, you get a more decentralized governance model around the, uh, the software itself because the software is autonomous by nature, right? And those who contribute the value, you redistribute the value of these things to the users who ultimately create the value in the first place, right? So if the value creation on Facebook is really because the internet, the business model of the internet is advertising, right? And so they, they're, they're incentivized to take all of your data just to sell more ads, that's the incentive model. But with crypto, we can change the incentive model, right? If you can do now like, you know, like to earn, right? And you can earn to participate in these things that ultimately make, make the network uh, quite a bit more valuable over time. Um, and then just being able to have this kind of like open development model around these things so that you know we can all participate in what is effectively autonomous software that will have minimal operating overhead, right? Because you don't have a massive company behind it that has to pay employees and HR departments and all these different things. You're actually re you're distributing the workforce through to the users who are ultimately interacting and using these applications itself. So it changes the way a lot of these companies work. And then because of things like data composability, if I want to use a different application, I just pop into that other application and my friends are already there. And that's the value that an end user gets, right? I don't have to ask Facebook's permission to go listen to music with them on Spotify. I just log in and they're already there. Um, and that's the value of having like a social protocol more broadly, which, you know, hopefully Elon will do the Twitter social protocol and just say, screw all the rest. We're going to go blue sky this. Yeah, totally. I think that's, you know, Twitter's best bet for sure. I can't wait to for see sure. that. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, and I love what you're saying about changing the incentives for social companies. Like right now, Twitter and Facebook and you know Google too, or I guess Google's different, but Twitter and Facebook have no incentive to you know favor their communities. Like it is financially profitable for them to you know continue on with these algorithms that favor hate speech and disinformation and like negative conversations. They get paid on eyeballs. Yeah, exactly. So I love what you're saying about changing the incentives around social. And so next, I want to move over to um, this topic of infrastructure. So Tom, I know that Warburg series invests in a lot of infrastructure and tooling, hence you know, this early investment into Definity. Yeah. So another category that we have for the Supernova Hackathon is infrastructure. And so with this sector, you know, developers aren't building for users, they are building for other developers. So yep. what are you specifically looking for when it comes to investing in Web3 infrastructure? Yeah, look, you know, we're still in the really early days of effectively building the next version of the internet, right? Web3 is what the internet should have been at the end of the day. Um, we're, we're so far from, you know, uh, although comparatively speaking, it'll probably take less time than it took the internet to be built over say 25, 30 years. Web3 will probably be built in about maybe half the amount of time, right? If you believe in just basic technological laws. Um, so, you know, when you think about the evolution of these different things, um, you know, building out a lot of this component architecture is, is what is it's what's ultimately going to enable application developers to, to build these brand new experiences that we all want. Um, so when we look at, you know, that sort of middleware infrastructure layer, um, you know, pretty much any component that you can think of that exists in Web 2 will need to be rebuilt in a Web 3 way. Right, an indexing solution, as an example, right, or you know, gosh, uh, storage, right? Like all these different things are ultimately going to have to be rebuilt. And some of the thing I always tell people is like, man, you know what? Just go to NPM, go to their website, and just like sort by popularity on all these like open source middleware components that basically every developer in the world currently uses, and just rebuild all of them because all of them are gonna to need to exist on these Web3 stacks to enable the kinds of experiences. There will be new ones too, right? Um, but ultimately, pretty much any component that you can think of that exists in Web2 that enables application development is gonna to have to be rebuilt in the Web3 stack and it'll be highly utilized um, because really the infrastructure just doesn't exist today. You can look at pretty much every ecosystem out there other than maybe Ethereum, uh, and they, you know, Ethereum has a tremendous amount of middleware, which is why they have such a large number of developers and applications relative or comparable to, say, other ecosystems. Um, and that's just because people have been building on top of Ethereum for a lot longer, right? And when you build apps, you think about the different kinds of components or middleware elements that are needed in order to enable my application. Um, a lot of those are gonna to have to be built on the IC and they're very basic components that essentially we already use and know today in a web two format. You just need to basically make them open source, come up with a governance utility model around that component. So, and then target the things that will allow for applications to be built much more quickly, right? Payment rails, like we are, we're investors in an IC project called Bunched She's building an indexing solution. She's building a payment rail, all so that she can enable a Patreon-like experience as an app at the application layer alongside NFT-based marketplaces on the IC, right? That stuff has to be built before she can even build that. So, you know, as a developer, you know, who is interested in DevOps or infrastructure. Go to NPM, sort by popularity, and start building, right? What are the most common components that people need to build apps? Go build those. 
Yeah, so it's almost like, you know, this infrastructure layer is a huge opportunity for developers, huge. but also a huge opportunity for VCs. Like this is the huge. kind of stuff that needs to get invested in first. Must. So, yeah, must for sure. Yeah. Love that. So I want to move over to kind of a conversation about like developer ecosystem right now. So Maria, you published this incredible report that has a ton of data about the velocity of developers that are entering the web three right now so there's soup there are a lot of really interesting stats in there if you haven't read it you know it's on the electric capital medium blog definitely go take a look um so maria tell us more about this picture that the report painted about how developers are breaking into web three you know so the report says things like you know the number of new crypto devs is growing for the first time since 2017 and you know these high quality ecosystems are growing while other lower quality ecosystems are shrinking so tell us more about you know the velocity of developers that are breaking into web3 right now yeah um this is uh so this is dat data up until the end of 2021 but um by december 2021 we kind of hit all-time highs for the number of developers working in open source crypto um and we index that at a little over eighteen thousand. um and keep in mind that this is actually a massive undercounting of developers working in crypto um because we only index open source that means that we are not including coinbase engineers as an example right like anything anyone who's working on a game probably closed sourced and probably not included in this report either. So um, so even just looking at uh, open source, which of course drives so much in, in the crypto space, but that has reached all time highs. Um, and the number of new developers coming in, um, in 2020, we had you know like 20,000 new developers touch a crypto related code repository for the first time. And in 2021, we had uh, over 34,000 new developers um, uh, touch a crypto-related code repository for the first time. And so um, even th the previous peak for the number of new developers joining was in 2018. And that year, um, you know, that year we saw about 30,000. And so 2021 was even a, uh, uh, e even more than the previous, previous high. Um, and so it's it's incredibly encouraging to see all of this growth, um, and it's also really interesting to see um, kind of sustained um, uh, sustained work as well. So, for example, um, you know across uh, across uh, Bitcoin, as an example, you you don't have a ton of new developers coming in, um, but you do have you know really dedicated developers who have been working on this. Um, one of the things we do is we look at, we break out you know, what it means to be a developer based on the number of commits that you, you push. Um, there's, there's many different ways to categorize this, but this is just one way that we picked, which is the ability to say, um, are you a full-time developer? Are you a part-time developer? Or are you someone who came in, uh, made one code change and kind of was never seen again? Um, and so the the growth of full time developers is usually what um, drives uh, drives development on in different ecosystems. And so you know for for some of the older ecosystems like Bitcoin, it is really incredible to see that um, uh, the growth is not as dramatic as it is in in other places. But um, you still had more than, you know, more than 600 new developers come into Bitcoin. But what's even more amazing is just the uh, sustained number of full-time developers who, regardless of market conditions, um, uh, work in that ecosystem. And then you also see other ecosystems growing very, very rapidly. Um, you know, Definity or I see as an example, uh, grew more than 4X in the number of um, developers that joined. So um, it is it is really incredible to, to kind of see that type of growth. Yeah, no, that's, it's such an in-depth report of, 
you know, a way of going about measuring developer activity and identifying who is a developer. It's, it's very hardcore and it tells you, you know, how complicated and, you know, in depth this type of work is. Um, and so in that report, you know, the ICP ecosystem has the third fastest developer growth rate clocking in at something like 370% year over year growth. So why do you think developers are building on the internet computer? And so maybe I'll throw this now to Tom. So would developers elect to build something on the internet computer because you know, of ease of use compared to different blockchains, um, the ability to run everything 100% on chain, you know, these unique features about the IC, like the reverse gas model for gasless DeFi or NFTs with no minting costs for users, like what makes this ecosystem attractive to developers? Yeah, <clears throat> I think that's a great, really great question. Um, you know, I think from a development perspective, there's a lot of greenfield, right? If you look at some of the most uh, used development frameworks up like Node.js has something like 10 million developers, right? So we're really far away from being saturated in the way that Web2 is. Um, and not all developers are, you know, the same, right? Like there's definitely developers who are better at DevOps first, you know, uh, client interface kind of work uh, or just pure interest, right? Um, and so things like, like middleware tooling um, and allows for a lot more developers to enter into the Web3 space more broadly, um, which is another reason to kind of, you know, spend a lot of time investing in that particular uh, layer to, to attract developers. Um, you know, it's, a, it's actually a real shame that, you know, uh, Linux Foundation, which basically controls a lot of these really great open source uh, technology solutions like Node.js and Kubernetes and so on, which are used quite, actually a lot of like Kubernetes is pretty heavily used in Web3, uh, actually. Um, it's really surprising that they would come out and be like, we're going to support Hyperledger, this permissioned chain that basically went nowhere and is essentially dead today. Right. They should really be embracing, you know, all of these different open standards across a wider variety of uh, crypto networks um, because they have an enormous number of developers that should know about Web3 and should be spending time uh, building out, you know, Web3 applications. In terms of why, you know, you might pick, say, IC versus any other thing, um, you know, I think when you uh, start building on the internet computer, um, you know, in a lot of ways, they, you know, Definity has spent an enormous amount of time trying to make it easier, right? Um, to build applications more broadly in a way that would be, you know, more congruent with how we do things in web two, right? Um, I think that, you know, as people begin to experience you know, uh, you know, even just simple things like hosting the entire application on the IC and fundamentally reducing risk more broadly associated with my application or assets tied to my application, the internet computer is going to ultimately be, you know, just a better solution, right? And developers will build wherever the demand is. So users demand like web two speed, right? Like we don't want slow applications. If you've ever played any of these games that run on, you know, Ethereum or whatever, they're slow and they're terrible, right? Axie Infinity did a lot of really cool stuff for gaming and really made it, but it's a shitty game. <laughs> Let's be real. It's not that great of a game. There's definitely better games out there like No Man's Sky and, you know, um, Elder Scrolls or whatever, right? Large scale, you know, MMOs that are just way more exciting and a lot more fun. Um, that, you know, for those kinds of games to come to uh, Web3, you really need the, the infrastructure to support them. And, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why I think, you know, the internet computer is so well positioned because even just simple things like if I'm going to render a virtual environment, right, I want that virtual environment rendered in a Web3 environment. I want it rendered on a Web3 stack because when I'm rolling around the metaverse, my VR headset on, 
Like, I want to know if what I'm seeing is actually authenticated and valid based on, you know, the fact that it's running on a Web3 stack. And you can't do that on pretty much any blockchain. Maybe the internet computer, you could probably render the actual VR environment because of the way they've constructed their network and the speed, at the, the processing speed that's required, the processing power that's required to do these things. Um, the IC is actually pretty well suited for um, high performance application requirements like video streaming, right? Which has upload speeds, download speeds, right? If you had to sit there and wait, you know, 10 minutes to walk 10 feet in a virtual environment, you're not going to play that game, right? And so I think, you know, when you, when you look at, you know, gaming by and large, that's where modern day games are. And if you want to attract modern game day, game developers, they're going to require and demand that kind of tooling because those are the kinds of experiences that they want to enable for an end user. And so I think, you know, Definity is pretty well suited to attract those kinds of developers because of the way that they've uh, ultimately designed things, even just with the composability aspects and hosting the whole application. And then the fact that it's super fucking fast, I, you know, using Definity feels like I'm using the normal internet. Uh, and I think that's a really powerful thing that once people experience that, um, you know, a light bulb goes off and they're like, oh, so it doesn't have to take five minutes for me to settle a transaction, right? It can be instant. Yeah, I love that. No, that's super well said for sure. Um, I think that is for sure what's you know unique about the internet computer when you're you know, using a blockchain, you normally, you know, you know that you're using a blockchain and yeah, Absolutely. we do need to support the ease of use and discoverability and all of these other features that are good about web two and not inherently bad, but you know, bring oh, features things that we love like over to the next to the next. I mean, let's face it, Amazon is amazing. Like they can ship me a whatever the hell I want same day. And like that's an awesome experience. I can one click pay on everything. And that's awesome. It's not like these are terrible companies per se or they terrible experiences. Um, and it's not even necessarily, you know, that Web3 is inherently better per se. It's just inevitable, right? It's inevitable that we're going to have a decentralized computing stack. It's inevitable that you're going to be, be building autonomous software applications and inevitable that you're going to have autonomous companies. So I think, you know, for those people that are considering getting into Web3, you know, just go read Kevin Kelly's book, The Inevitable, right? And you'll see that throughout history, we've had these moments of inevitability. And I think Web3 is one of those moments where the whole world is shifting to a Web3 stack. For sure. Yeah. Okay. So I want to talk about, you know, this concept I mentioned before about the founder profile. So, you know, in Web3, there is not yet a prototypical founder or entrepreneur. So you can tell me if this is a wild exaggeration, like you're the one who like you guys are the people who are taking like the pitch meetings, but you know, it seems like as a VC in web three, you could be talking to a 16 year old blockchain game developer who has, you know, ideated this incredible metaverse environment that's gaining a ton of traction organically, or, you know, you could be on zoom with an anonymous founder who you'll never meet in person, but they've written this amazing code or, you know, a technical founder who, um, you know, has never pitched to a VC or anything like that in their life, um, but they're walking you through code. So, you know, you mentioned, Tom, that, you know, you invest in people um, and that that's kind of a primary like factor that you look at is who is this person. Um, but, you know, you're going to be in these different environments where you may never meet these founders, um, but you still have to decide if you're going to write a million dollar check or something like that. So beyond this core prototype or technical durability of a company, what are you looking for in your entrepreneurs and your teams? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, when I meet a team, I pretty much know right away whether or not, you know, we're going to write a check or not. Pro usually, to be totally honest, because most founders don't actually understand this, and I feel obligated to tell them the truth. Most VCs know within the first five minutes of meeting you whether they're going to invest or not. That's the reality, right? Especially at early stage, right? Because at the end of the day, at the early stage, you're betting on a paper napkin with a drawing on it, right? That's really what you're betting on. 
Um, but, you know, as you get into later stage financing opportunities and traditional venture capital and web two, yeah, it's like, okay, what's your DAU? What's your, you know, revenue? What's your EBITDA? Like your metrics become a little bit more important as you scale and grow, because that's basically what you're raising money for is you're trying to, when you raise money, you're spending ahead of revenue, right? So you're saying, Hey, I'm going to go invest here because I, and I want to spend ahead of revenue because I want to go to this other point, you know, 50 light years ahead of me. Um, and so, you know, when we're looking at, you know, these different projects and these different founders, you know, there's a lot of that to consider. Um, but you know, I think the one thing that I can, you know, I, I like product people. I like people that think about product. I love developers, right? Because, you know, that's really, you know, especially if you're a developer, you know, and a product person, like that's usually a good thing. Um, and then the other thing I try to ultimately, you know, smell out is, you know, are you crypto native, right? And I think that's a really, that's really hard. That's a very subjective way of looking at things. There's not a lot of data there. You just know though, right? Like one crypto person definitely knows another crypto person and you can experience them. And I, and I say like, oftentimes like oh, that guy's pretty crypto native, right? Where he just fundamentally understands the whole idea of composability, fundamentally understands, you know, these kind of autonomous software environments. And, you know, I think they can, they can imagine experiences, product experiences that only a crypto native person who spent a lot of time really trying to understand this stuff can really fundamentally understand. Um, and it, it's not that you can't become crypto native. It's just that like, you know, you know, like if you've spent enough time in the space and you've spent enough time researching these things, you're not just taking a web two idea and throwing it on a blockchain and raising money like those, I can spot a mile away. Right. And those are the projects I definitely don't want. Right. I don't want you just to build a game and insert an NFT. I want you to build a game that is by nature decentralized, right? And open source and I can build on it. Um, and so I think that's probably, you know, the, the main thing that I like to consider is whether or not they're crypto native. And, you know, a lot of that just comes sitting, having a conversation with them and riffing with them, talking to them about their ideas, seeing how deep, you know, they can go and, you know, um, and I think usually within a you know handful of minutes, I pretty much know right away. And then from there, it becomes more about like, okay, what's your market? Who are you going after? Right? How big can it be? Uh, because we want to invest in companies that are infinitely scalable and could be unbelievably massive on pretty much every deal we do. For sure. Yeah. Well, so same question to you, Maria. Like, what are you looking for in your entrepreneurs and teams? Yeah, um, you know, I, I think there are the things that are uh, that are pretty typical, like what is the size of the market that you're trying to tackle? Uh, do you have the do you have the right people to execute on this, this idea? Um, I, are you are you technical and able to build it? Um, but I think to your to your question in terms of what you know, what are the characteristics of the founders? Um, and what do I look for there? Um, I think a lot of it boils down to uh, to, to thoughtfulness um, and creativity. Um, I think creativity is incredibly important in the Web3 space because no one actually knows how any of this is supposed to work. Um, and so you really have to think outside the box. I think a very typical example of this is, um, you know, how just reimagining how exchanges could work in a decentralized way. For a very long time, people built exchanges with the old um, order book model because the, the thought there is, well, you would need a seller and you need a buyer and you need to match the seller to the buyer. Um, when in, in reality, the thing that ended up working was actually uh, you know, Uniswap, like a pooled model. Um, and you would actually swap tokens back and forth just based on a very simple equation. Um, and it's, it is, you know, I, I think you need a shift in mindset to be able to imagine something like that. The, the mechanics are not complicated, um, but I, you know, the, the ability to think outside the box is, 
is, is the hard part, I would say. Um, and so I think this is also what Tom was kind of referring to as well in, in that kind of crypto nativeness. I think, um, you know, the, the, the ability to not apply what works in web two and, and just copy paste it into web three is incredibly important. Um, and the second thing is thoughtfulness. We're often the first check in. And so we're investing in founders very, very early. Um, and whatever is being presented in the slides um, will mm -hmm. probably certainly change. Always uh, changes. <laughs> exactly. Um, I would be I would be more shocked if it didn't change. Um, and I think it comes from, you know, founders make a set of assumptions around what they think will work. And then given those assumptions, what is the what is the natural uh What's the, what's the natural kind of like implications of that? And they build their product around that. But if it turns out that one of your core assumptions was wrong, which it often can be, or the crypto market shifts, you know, under your foot, then, um, then you need to be able to adapt very, very quickly. And so I think when I talk to founders, I usually try to tease out what are the underlying assumptions that you're making um, for this to work. And how deeply have you thought about that? And tease out whether, you know, if it turns out this assumption is not correct or that assumption is not correct, would you be able to pivot quickly? Um, and, you know, I, I think that ability is incredibly important for early stage companies where nothing is really set in stone. Yeah, I love that. I think that's super well said about the assumptions. I think with work in general, like everywhere, we are operating off of assumptions that we have in our head about who are developers, what do they want, you know, like what is necessary in this, you know, marketplace that I'm trying to change as the founder or something like that. But, you know, you have to take your ego out of the equation and be willing to be thoughtful and creative and be proven wrong um, by, by everything. So I love that. I love that perspective. Um, so we're seeing this cultural macro trend of anti-work right now that's manifesting itself in what's being called the great resignation accompanied mm -hmm. by, you know, this general fatigue and rejection of web two that I've just observed working in web three. So, you know, some would argue that right now there has never been a more urgent time for entrepreneurs to build. Um, I mean, committing to this idea that's been sitting in your notes app for years and getting involved in a hackathon is something that could change someone's life completely. You know, you could quit your job, you could start a new company and really do something impactful in a space that is very much a new frontier. Um, so I think, you know, my question to both of you is really in this time when it's never been more urgent for entrepreneurship to be funded and for projects to be built, um, you know, like what advice do you have in general to people who are crypto curious or people who are crypto natives who want to leverage the internet computer and web three in general to start building? Happy to dive in. Um, you know, I, I have built company built companies before. I'm still building a company, right? The private equity group is also a company, right? Um, I would say that the fundamental principles of company building doesn't necessarily change just because you're in crypto, right? Um, you know, I think there are some, you know, as you, you building a company is really hard. It's not easy, uh, especially hiring people is really hard. Scaling a company, managing your burn is even more difficult, right? Um, and it, that problem is gonna probably be further compounded when you have founders with billions in treasury, right? Trying to figure out how to build their app because it's <clears throat> so massively valuable and they still have a whole lot of stuff to build. Um, and so, you know, I try to, you know, I spend a lot of time um, here with our founders a lot. I roll up my sleeves, I get into projects um, and I, I don't tweet, I don't Facebook, I don't do any of that shit. Um, I'm too busy. Uh, and I, 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 I love helping the founders because I was a founder, 
And I know how, I know the psychology of a founder and how hard it is to do these things. And you really just need somebody in your camp um, that's willing to help you build because that's what you really should be doing at the end of the day. Um, you know, there's some tr there's some truisms. Always have options. Always, right? Uh, never allow yourself to be in a situation where you don't have an option. Uh, or um, you know, you're always fundraising. <laughs> always. <laughs> You're never not fundraising. You better get that. You should definitely get that ingrained in your brain. Um, you know, and I think that's a really hard one because like in crypto, most of the founders I meet are developers um, and fundraising does not come naturally to a lot of developers and that's totally okay. But it is a skill that you have to learn. It is definitely something that you, you, you can learn and you can train. And to be frank, you know, fundraising is a lot of passion and storytelling and interest and excitement and dreaming. Um, and that's how you raise money. And, and I think, you know, you can definitely uh, do a lot of that, you know, as a developer. And I really like helping them think through, like, how do you architect your deck and how do you, you know, position what it is that you're doing? How do you, how do you get a uh, message market fit? with the product that you're building. It's cool tech, but how do we actually get it in the hands of people so that they're actually using it? How do you build community, right? Because community is absolutely critical uh, to a successful crypto projects. It's one of the main things most of these exchanges look at pre-listing. So if you're hoping to have your token listed on exchange, you better have a huge community around it because that's one of the primary requirements that they look into. Um, so, and I think at the end of the day, it kind of goes back to some of the stuff that, you know, uh, Marie was mentioning earlier, right? A startup and assumptions, like so important, actually. Um, you know, one of my uh, first investors once told me, he said, a startup is an experiment to see if a business should exist, right? So, and I think a lot of engineers can understand that concept, right? It's an experiment. So, you know, lay out your assumptions, come up with some hypotheses, come up with metrics to track against those things, and, you know, it's okay, like failure is amazing data, right? Just grab the data, turn around and do something else and iterate on it and pivot um, and then maintain the stamina around that. Because I think that's the hard part is like constant failure uh, really drags on you after a while, but eventually you get there and you, you gain a lot of insight along the way. So I guess that's, that's kind of how I would think about it. Apply the scientific method to your company. I love that. Incredible. You have to. <laughs> awesome. Okay. There's well, same. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so same kind of question to you, um, Maria. So, you know, we're seeing people in the ICP ecosystem, you know, quitting their jobs at, you know, Uber, Google, wherever it may be, and coming to build on this blockchain. So, you know, what advice do you have for founders specifically in Web3? Yeah. I think Tom covered, honestly, a lot of really great points. Um, so maybe I'll speak a little bit to uh, to, to funding because um, uh, I, I think Tom covered the building stuff really, really well. Um, I think for funding, you know, always think, think less about the capital and more about who you want by your side. Um, and, you know, when times are good or when times are bad, who do you want to spend time with? And um, who do you think will be will be helpful? Um, you know, approach kind of your cap table the same way that you would approach building out your team for your own company. So look for people with complementary skill sets. Um, you know, think try to envision like how this person could add value and, and plug into what you're doing, um, and be really thoughtful about that. And I, I think that's. You know, I, I think the, the capital the capital is 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 great, but you're almost marrying <laughs> this set mm -hmm. of investors. So you so really, true. yeah. So you really, really need to make sure that, that these are people who have your best interests in heart and can um, can be there for you when times are tough. Um, and I would say the second thing to think about, which is uh probably even like a little bit anti <laughs> what i'm working on uh, since i'm a vc firm but there are different ways to raise capital even outside of looking at vc firms um i've seen a lot of teams you know fund themselves through launching uh launching nfts um yeah. 
uh, I've seen fair launches. Uh, we've all seen kind of like a fair number of those and um, DAOs often now um, invest as well. I, it's, it's, it's kind of this strange new world where we often see ourselves um, investing with, with DAOs as well. Um, I think uh, looking at angel investors are always a really great way to pull in people who are um, uh, angel, especially angel investors who are founders. So other founders that you want to help you, um, getting them to write an angel check is always a really great way to get someone who's, um, who's a builder, who uh, understands what you're going through, um, and you know may not actually write a big check, but will be committed um, to helping you. And I think those are all good options to to look at and to explore. And um, you know, don't be too uh, don't be don't have too much tunnel vision in terms of um, where you can raise capital from. Yeah, totally. I think that's something that's overlooked and maybe not something that's understood very well in like the tech and VC landscape is that, you know, ultimately when it comes to accepting a check and making a VC deal, it's not always about the capital. It's about, you know, what the investor can offer a founder in terms of network and advice and, you know, also, you know, filling in gaps of, or like knowledge gaps or something like that. So I think, you know, that's a great perspective to carry over for here too. And, yeah. And I think probably the last thing is always um, background check your investors too. talk to, yeah. talk to founders that they've invested in. Um, and you'll usually get a really honest response from other founders in terms of what is it really like to work with this investor and, you know, how have they been helpful? And those types of conversations are, are really great for, for ultimately picking who you want to work with. Awesome. Maria, I think that's a really great point. I'm super glad that you mentioned that because it's critical when yeah. you're building a company. You want your VC on your team. They're your business partner, basically. They're equally as incentivized. Uh, they actually think a lot of founders forget that because they they do just look at the capital requirement. But at the end of the day, it's like, I'm on your team now, dude. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. So you better call me if you need something. So as we've learned today, the investment landscape looks quite different for Web3 and VC than it did five years ago, even. And hackathons and grant programs are an amazing risk-free way to build in Web3 right now. Um, so this panel has been great. Thank you so much, Tom and Maria. Um, I know your insights are going to inspire entrepreneurs and developers to leverage Web3 and the internet computer and you know, really get them on track to receive their first big check. So thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having us.